Eu tenho a alegria, a honra, a satisfação de abrir a sessão de encerramento, a palestra de encerramento do nosso colóquio, do Colóquio Internacional Imagens é, Religiosas do Mundo Romano. É, e agradecendo profusamente, profundamente, o é, Dr. Peter Stewart, da Faculty of Classics da Universidade de Oxford, é, por ter aceito o convite, por ter se juntado a nós. É, no Brasil, ele é especialmente conhecido por duas obras, o livro Status in Roman Society, é, sobre representações e respostas, e a, o livro é, The Social History of Roman Arts. São as duas obras mais conhecidas aqui no Brasil. Mas muitos dos presentes aqui, das pessoas presentes, conhecem artigos, discussões e acompanham a, a, a obra do é, Dr. Peter Stewart, a quem eu agradeço muito a presença. Nós agradecemos a presença. Obrigada. Thank you very much. And uh, I, let me begin by saying what a real honor and privilege it has been to be here in Rio. Uh, it has been a wonderful experience to be here and also to see for myself this dynamic and important community of ancient world scholarship uh, at UniRio. Uh, so thank you very much to Claudia and Federico for, for giving me this opportunity. It, it's a daunting experience normally to give the last paper, but I'm very relieved you haven't asked me to summarize all the wonderful rich presentations we've had over the last couple of days. The technology of classical naturalism then. It's my general experience that adding a question mark to the end of a title covers a multitude of sins, implying the complexity of the subject and avoiding accusations that one is being overly positive or uncritical. And you will notice that I have added a question mark to the title I originally proposed for this paper. But I do in fact want both to raise and question a hypothesis, uh, which is this that the naturalistic style that is the hallmark of classical art had a particular function, a particular religious utility um, in, the, in the creation of cult images, even in the Roman imperial period, long after that style was invented. My answers to this question will be mixed and they'll take us beyond the Roman Empire to the fringes of the Roman world, broadly defined, and in fact, even to the art of Central Asia. I'm using classical style as a shorthand. What I really mean is the repertoire of styles and representational devices that characterize the Greco-Roman artistic tradition from around the early fifth century BC onwards. That is to say, the repertoire of conventions for representing subjects naturalistically in a way that is selectively true to life. Classical naturalism involves the observation of bodies and movement, of anatomy and space, conjuring up the impression of reality rather than relying predominantly on abstract formulae and schemata. However, in classical Greece, and to a greater or lesser extent throughout Greco-Roman art, this sense of reality was balanced by idealization. So naturalism is a matter of conventionalized plausibility more than realism. Here I've arbitrarily chosen uh, a couple of the famous works of classical Greek sculpture to show how this idiom was employed at different frequencies, so to speak for the representation of the gods. Indeed, the demands of religious representation may have been partly responsible for the development of classical naturalism in the first place. Its origins are a huge and controversial subject, which I don't need to go into now. But it's important to note that in more recent years, scholars trying to explain the Greek revolution, which gave rise to naturalistic representations around 500 BC, let's say, uh, 
have seen this stylistic development in functional terms. They've asked how social and ideological shifts drove artistic change. For example, how did naturalism serve the increasing differentiation of gods and humans? Or how did it animate the athletic victory statues which flourished as elite monuments in place of funerary display at the end of the archaic period? The word style is rather misleading in this context because its various meanings imply habitual practices on the part of artists or whole cultures, whereas we might better think of naturalistic art as a technology or a package of techniques, technical know-how applied to a particular practical function rather than merely learned tendencies passed between generations of craftsmen. But if that suggestion is plausible for the 5th century BC, it's harder to maintain several hundred years later when the repertoire of forms developed and elaborated by Greek artists had been inherited en masse by the artists of the late Roman Republic and Empire. By the Roman Imperial period, the heritage of naturalistic styles was conservatively embedded in art and especially in sculptural representations of the gods. It's easy to see this as a nosified classicism, and for generations that assumption contributed to the relative neglect of Roman art and scholarship. More positively, we can see the retrospection of Roman art as the transformation of a diachronic stylistic history of Greek art into a synchronic visual language, as was suggested in the pioneering works of Paul Zanke and Tony Hilscher in the 1970s and 1980s. And I should say that my very last slide will have some bibliographical references for the particular authors I refer to. In other words, the Roman period artists had at their disposal the whole range of past Greek styles which could be deployed as appropriate in different contexts and for different subjects. Hilscher shows, for example, how those styles worked for differing kinds of divine images. Archaism lending dignity and a sense of primitivism to mature images of Dionysus on the left. The nobility and youth of the classical Polycleitan body borrowed for that aspect of Antinous in the middle. Or alternatively, his epiphanic radiance evoked by the use of the late 4th century BC Apollo Lycaos type. These are all examples used by Hilscher. Roman cult images were especially conservative and retrospective. Not only did they employ earlier Greek styles, but they frequently copied sculptural types which had their origins in the classical period. We need only think about the highest profile example in Rome, the Jupiter Capitolinus, um, uh, sh shown in its uh, post-Flavian form here, or the post-Flavian form of the temple. The statue doesn't survive, but the coin representations demonstrate its reliance on a tradition that goes back to Olympian's use. While acknowledging this stylistic conservatism, I want to look again at classical naturalism in this relatively late Roman setting and ask what, if anything, this style or mode of representation might have contributed to the effect of cult images and to the way people experienced them and interacted with them. I'll be concentrating here on what I call cult images, and particularly cult statues, rather than religious images in general. Um, I don't want to get too distracted by the problem of definition here, which Claudia touched on on the first day. But what I'm mainly talking about is the sort of statues which would have stood in a temple or shrine as one of the major focuses of veneration, standing as a proxy for the deity. Some have questioned whether such a category as the cult image existed in ancient thought. No good word or phrase exists for it in English, Though the German temple cult built captures part of the sense. For the Romans, these were simulacra, or sometimes signa, 
or less precisely in Greek, a galmata. But the terminology is slippery. In my 2003 book, Statues in Roman Society, I argued that the concept of the cult statue existed, but that the categorical boundaries were fluid and challenging even for the Romans themselves. The conceptual problem is mirrored in the difficulty of recognizing Roman cult images today. Perhaps that's why relatively little has been written about them from an archaeological perspective. A Roman statue of a god taken out of context might be a votive or a garden sculpture or a religiously themed decoration for baths or some other uh, public building. Again, it's the problem that Claudia raised with Cicero on, on uh, Tuesday. It's significant that cult images don't necessarily look distinctly like cult images. But some of them do. Some of them look the part. It would be hard to imagine this statue of Minerva from Rome as anything but a temple cult statue, enthroned in forbidding majesty at one end of her shrine. Coins and representations in other media, as well as abundant literary evidence, help to evoke a wider range, a wider repertoire of images in their context across the empire. Um, the goddess now in the Palazzo Massimo in Rome is a slightly problematic example because it was actually found headless in 1923 near the River Tiber, about 500 meters to the southwest of the Circus Maximus. Its head and the Gorgonaeon, which secure its identification, were restored with a Minerva face of Carpegna type. But its extraordinarily vivid, uh, 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 lively polychromy, created here by white Italian marble, alabaster and basalt, and its stately seated position, are, I think, quite evocative of many cult images of the kind, and the restoration here is entirely plausible. Uh, here are two more examples of these sorts of statues. Some cult images do have heads of their own, I promise, but these were <laughs> nice examples and they've lost theirs. We don't know the particular circumstances in which ancient viewers would have encountered such statues because the conditions of access evidently varied from one temple or sanctuary to another. But they do seem to assume a face-to-face -face encounter. Their naturalistic appearance makes them believable and rather terrifying stand-ins for the god. Of all the aspects of the deity's appearance or character that could have been communicated by the religious image, here the emphasis is on their anthropomorphic presence. They were very much, they're very much, they very much inhabit uh, the worshippers' human world. So it would be possible to suggest that the statue's naturalism contributes to their psychological effect in those circumstances. The psychological and indeed emotional effect of any image, its affective aspect, needs to be taken into account in any consideration of religious images. It takes us away from the formalistic view of stylistic traditions in classical art. It's a truism that images can be powerful and that power can be derived from their aesthetic configuration. Through the impact of their appearance, images don't just make us feel things, they make us feel things towards them, whether awe, fear, love, affection, and so on, or indeed desire, as suggested in the realm of religion by the ancient tales of a galmatophilia, love of cult statues. And aside from the mythological Pygmalion, the most famous of these is the, no doubt, apocryphal story recorded by Pliny, Pseudo-Lucian and other authors about the frustrated lover of the Aphrodite of Cnidus who closeted himself with the statue so that he could make love to her. There's an abundance of textual evidence, much of it surveyed in, uh, for example, in Polly Weddle's uh, helpful PhD thesis on the subject, uh, 
abundant textual evidence to suggest that in real life, Romans interacted with statues or imagined themselves interacting with them in accordance with the full spectrum of feelings that I've mentioned. In the last few years, there's been a huge increase of art historical and archaeological interest in the agency of objects and works of art. Very influential here is the anthropologist Alfred Gell's posthumously published 1998 masterpiece, Art and Agency, an Anthropological Theory. I think, truthfully, that Gell's work has been rather overused, and I've barely read a PhD draft in the last few years that doesn't have a section of Gellian theory, regardless of its subject. We tend, perhaps, to bandy the term agency around uh, maybe, maybe too freely. But nevertheless, for me, this book is still deeply persuasive and illuminating. Among many other arguments, Gell shows in very engaging terms, ranging far beyond his own specialism, which is Melanesian anthropology, he shows why it makes sense for people to deal with images and objects within social relationships as if they're alive inferring their agency, or the agency that works through them. To present this sort of response to images as make-believe, as some scholars have in the past, doesn't do justice to their act of social role, to which the objection, but they're not really alive, is scarcely relevant. As I've suggested elsewhere, Gell's approach does a lot to help us understand the treatment of cult images in societies that use them. And it also helps us to understand our own everyday actions with objects, to understand the sort of personhood and, and personality that artifacts assume in our lives because they give us the cues we need to understand them as efficacious social particip participants. I'll give you one example, or one everyday example here, to demonstrate that the power of images to generate affective relationships is not limited to the sphere of religious faith nor excluded from rational modern life. When we say that this toy looks cute, the act of voice in English, in the English word looks, has a real force. No essay witty actor here. We don't have to evoke theories of extramission, the idea that objects are visible because of their active emission of particles or rays, to, to, to realize that it's the rabbit that's doing the looking here. Being cute is active. And it's doing that by virtue of the emotional appeal designed into it. Alfred Gell is explicitly little interested in iconography or style, or Saussurian uh, semiotics. He's mainly concerned with what images do, rather than what they look like or how they communicate. But the aesthetic configuration of images is important for some of his theories. And indeed, he's particularly concerned in some of his writings with the technology of enchantment, as he calls it, which he believes worked uh, works through the virtuoso carved pry boards of Tobriand Islanders' canoes, as illustrated here. In the responses to these works of art, Gell argues not only for the commercially beneficial psychological effect of their complex imagery, but more to the point, the inference of magical power behind that effect. Now, in the utterly different domain of naturalistic figurative representation, we can argue for the same sort of mechanism of response. Naturalistic images have an immediate psychological impact, but they also encourage us to infer agency behind them. In our case, the agency of the god who is represented. It must be admitted that classical cult images are generally not as cute as the rabbit. But in principle, their design is no less relevant to their effective appeal to viewers and how that makes them think about the image's power. So we might immediately assume that their artistic strategy considerably enhances the image's capabilities. 
Uh, and to be clear, I think that that probably is the case at a certain level. Uh, we can recognize that intuitively. But the suggestion needs to be qualified. For a start, let's be clear that there are no illusionistic tricks going on with these cult images, which is not to say that accessories like clothing and food weren't provided to classical cult images. The statue's sculptural realism is nevertheless decidedly measured. Perhaps we should say that they're realistically represented as detached, emotionless, above real life. Contrast, for example, the lifelike Christian effigies of the Baroque and post-Baroque periods. Unlike these extravagant, illusionistic appeals to the senses and emotions, all of the ancient sculptures I've shown so far are classicizing. The stereotypical classical face, with its associations of emotional self-control, have... Um, that sort of face has an ever youthful, impassive, symmetrical, and unindividualized appearance. The poses of those figures are static, and that's not because they're unnaturalistic. It's as if they've chosen to sit still because that's what's appropriate for the gods. Nevertheless, this sort of iconography is not universal or even the norm for cult statues in the Roman world. In many other cases, the naturalistic animation of statues could be seen as a disadvantage because it forces them to strike an attitude rather than simply sitting or, or standing with grandiose receptivity. Naturalistic action and movement in art can positively undermine cult statues' potential to instill reverent one-to-one -one engagement with the god. We might recall, for example, all those images of Diana hunting, or Apollo playing the lyre, or uh, the Praxitalian Sauroctonos, lizard killer type which seems to have been copied for the cult images at Apollonia, at Rindacus, and, and maybe elsewhere. Or we might even think about the Venus statues, Venus caught off guard while bathing in countless Roman statues of the Pudica type. Presumably some of them were actually cult statues rather than just ornamenta for gardens or baths. In all of these sorts of cases, the viewer encountering the cult statue would have been presented with a sort of narrative tableau, almost, or at least an opportunity to spy upon the deity in some characteristic activity. So these sorts of naturalistic representations, while they might inspire reflections about the god, don't offer the same sort of direct encounter with the icon-like proxy image these snapshots of divine action may not have carried the same sort of effective punch as more restrained iconography, um, I, but nevertheless, they, they offer other kinds of insights into the narratives and the personalities of gods. So there's a sort of trade-off they lose in some respects and they gain in others. What I'm saying is that the techniques of naturalistic representation have their limitations as well as benefits when it comes to conjuring up the presence of the god and facilitating communication or interaction between gods and mortals. In cultic imagery, less is sometimes more. Indeed, it's worth remembering that naturalistic representational conventions are only one technology among several that could serve to animate a cult statue. The ancient sources tell us sporadically about statues that were able to speak by means of concealed tubes. And of course, the false prophet Alexander of Abonotechus's portable cult image, Glycon, which became famous in the second century empire, was animated by trickery using the windpipe of a crane. In a seminal article of 1945, Frederick Poulsen reviewed the evidence of talking statues and other such miracles and interpreted a head of Epicurus in the New Carlsberg Glyptotech in Copenhagen as just such an image which had, he believed, been adapted so that mysterious pronouncements could be intoned through its mouth from behind. <laughs> 
through a pipe. Um, the curators nowadays have used plaster to seal the, the hole in its mouth. But the important thing to note is that these sorts of cases are the exceptions that prove the rule. If cult images were expected to be animated in a lively fashion, there might have been much more of this kind of thing. Instead, visual representation of lifelike divinities thrived on inference and implication, on the mere trigger to a fantasy that the statue could stand up and walk out of the room. It's a technology of evocation rather than a mechanical fraud. Otherwise, the statue really would be magic, like the haunted statue of Pelicus, which walks about at night in Lucian's Philopsudes. The corollary of this is that, yes, I think classical naturalism can be seen as a sort of animating technology that serves the interests of cult images, but its utility was circumscribed and should not be exaggerated. Moreover, we shouldn't underestimate the beholder's share, as Ernst Gombrich called it, uh, in animating artefacts. People can develop social relationships with objects that are much less elaborate uh, than naturalistic statues. Ancient and iconic cult images were, in fact, especially revered. And by the second and third centuries AD, we encounter numerous examples of these non-anthropomorphic cult images receiving essentially the same kind of veneration as figural sculptures across the Roman Empire. We don't call them statues because that term is almost inseparable from anthropomorphic representation in modern languages, uh, modern languages of European origin. But in terms of people's religious interactions with them, they were just like the classical naturalistic statues, as we see from the way they're framed in coin representations standing like conventional statues in the cellae of their temples. Here, for example, is the famous and iconic image of Elagabal at a mesa in Syria, whose priest became the emperor Elagabalus in AD 218. We don't have this image today. It was probably a meteorite with some figural elaboration. But uh, here is the surviving conical meteorite from Paphos in Cyprus, which is probably the cult image of Paphian Aphrodite, famous in antiquity, here represented in her Bronze Age style temple. Perhaps it's hard to imagine Paphian Aphrodite having the same visceral erotic appeal reportedly exercised by the Aphrodite of Cnidus. But cult images of this kind could be no less active and actively engaged in interaction with human beings uh, than anthropomorphic images. To go back to this image, the uniconic image of Elagabal is a nice illustration. Herodian describes its chariot processions after Elagabalus had it relocated to Rome. Uh, no person sat in the chariot, he writes, nor did anyone hold the reins, but they were actually fastened to the god himself as if he were driving. Herodian adds that the emperor ran along in front, backwards, holding the reins of the six horses. So to our sceptical eyes, or to Herodian, this looks like an absurd make-believe, attributing to the god the agency that actually belongs to the horses or to the man leading them. But a more sympathetic viewer would regard this as a convincing demonstration of the god's agency, as it sits in the dignified stillness we would expect of a potent god or a stone, while at the same time evidently, evidently being the cause of the chariot's movement, because after all, who else is driving it? Literally no one. The major and iconic cult images like these are exceptional but they provide a limit case of how far cult images can depart from naturalistic representation while still remaining fully functioning. Their efficacy prompts us to ask, what is the real added value provided by naturalistic sculpture? Of course, human form is one of the most important aspects of the gods as the Romans conceived them. But anthropomorphism doesn't require particularly naturalistic illusionism. 
Perhaps more importantly, as Richard Gordon has described, participating in an iconographical system allowed gods to be recognized and reproduced universally in the Roman Empire. The use of anthropomorphic iconography therefore balances out the aniconic image's unique selling point that it is special, unreproducible, numinous, uh, an object often literally fallen from the heavens. But again, reproducible iconography does not require successful naturalism. Indeed, the iconographical attributes of the gods are the most consistently transmitted component in religious art of the Roman provinces, even when lack of skill or interest has led to the abandonment of protocols of naturalistic representation. So does this mean that the effectiveness of cult images is connected only in very general terms with the mode of representation rather than with specific stylistic strategies? Up to a point, I think this is true. The technological advantages of naturalistic illusionism are only one factor in the design of Roman cult images. And in this connection, we might also consider the gamut of modern Hindu representations of gods which employ naturalistic devices to varying extents. Many use naturalistic conventions like lifelike staring faces or uh, to, to exercise a, a psychological appeal very similar to that of Roman or modern Christian uh, effigies. And in fact, these wonderful images are in the Folk Museum in, uh, in Kochi, in Kerala. Um, and in the same tradition, we, we do, in fact, have Christian images. But once again, semi-iconic and aniconic images, including uh, the, the Shiva Lingam, are tended and venerated as physical proxies for the absent god, no less than if they used mimetic tricks to pose as human figures. Uh, three examples in India here of differing degrees of anthropomorphism uh, from the more or less naturalistic statue on the left to the Shiva Lingam on the right, all being venerated in the same way. I want to stick with the Indian theme for the rest of this paper by offering an example from outside the classical world proper, which at least casts a sidelight on the value of classical naturalism as an artistic technique. My example is the representation of the Buddha in the art of ancient Gandhara. As many of you will know, Gandhara is an ancient name conventionally used to describe a region more or less around the northern tip of modern Pakistan, uh, including parts of Afghanistan. In the first few centuries AD, Buddhism flourished in Gandhara. For much of this period, it was an important part of the Kushan Empire of Central Asia and Northern India, and it seems to have flourished in the stable conditions created by the Pax Kushanica, as it's being dubbed. The Gandhara, Gandhara has been called the crossroads of Asia, and it was apparently on trade routes that connected Rome with China and India with Central Asia. In the early centuries AD, there was an explosion of stone monuments across this small region. The Buddhist population of Gandhara sought to convert their wealth into merit, securing a better life or future lives for themselves through virtuous donations. In this way, many dozens of monasteries were embellished with shrines, and particularly reliquary shrines called stupas, which are illustrated here in various forms. They were adorned with, the stupas were adorned with sculptures, mostly executed in the local slate-like schist to begin with, and later on, mainly from the third century onwards, uh, by stucco and terracotta sculptures. When Gandharan art was rediscovered by classically educated Western soldiers and administrators in the late 19th century, when the region was the northwest frontier of British India, they were astonished by the sculptor's affinities to classical art. The Gandharan artists had drawn upon the repertoire of Greco-Roman naturalistic techniques and iconography, 
Gandharan art also echoes conventions of other traditions, but the classical element is still obvious and still puzzling. Time and again, the classical archaeologist recognises traces of Greco-Roman imagery in the, in the styles, compositions, gestures, uh, clothing types, and even the mythological personnel of the Buddhist art of Gandhara. A nice example here of the, what we would call the Trojan horse story on a Roman sarcophagus lid in Oxford below, and then metamorphosed into, probably into a Buddhist story uh, in the Gandharan sculpture above. It's long been believed that the classical appearance of Gandharan art is a broadly Hellenistic phenomenon. Because Gandhara had been conquered by Alexander the Great, and Bactria, roughly northern Afghanistan, remained a substantial Greek kingdom. Local rulers of Greek culture and descent were in control of Gandhara at certain times right up to the first century BC, uh, a bilingual coin here of uh, Antiochus of Taxila. Uh, on the other hand, Gandharan Buddhist sculpture emerged later in the first century AD, and it seems to become most classical looking in the second century AD. Consequently, the once controversial idea that contemporary contact with the Roman Empire was at least partly responsible for Gandharan classicism is now becoming almost the consensus. We don't need to resolve this contentious issue for the moment. Suffice it to say that by means and for reasons still only partly understood, the artists of Gandhara were drawing very skillfully and deftly on the Greco-Roman artistic tradition rooted several thousand kilometers to the west. It's in this context that the image of the Buddha himself was invented. The historical wise man known as the Buddha, the enlightened one, Siddhartha Gautama, lived probably in the 5th century BC. But there's no proven representation of him before around the 1st century AD. In early Buddhist art in India, the Buddha is represented by his symbols rather than human form. As with the absence of Christian art in the first two centuries AD, there's been much debate about whether this gap is the result of a deliberate aniconism. At any rate, <clears throat> the anthropomorphic image of the Buddha appears almost simultaneously around the start of the second century AD, or a little earlier, both in Gandhara and at Mathura in northern India both part of the Kushan Empire at that time. Mataran sculptures are relatively abstract and schematic in the Indian artistic tradition, perhaps. But the Gandharan artists made a choice which was to be extremely influential on later Buddhist art down to the present. They dipped into the repertoire of Greco-Roman art, uh, religious art specifically, to choose a very human form for the Buddha his body and clothing and sculpture are highly naturalistic. His face and hair recall classical and Hellenistic conventions for representations, uh, for representations of gods. And in particular, many Gandharan Buddhas closely recall the imagery of Apollo and Diana. The relationship is so striking in certain cases that the ultimately classical origin of the Gandharan Buddha iconography seems really beyond doubt. The case is especially interesting from the perspective of classical art history, because here we have an example of the fresh contemporary adoption of classical religious imagery to serve a particular artistic need. I should stress at this point that we don't know why the anthropomorphic Buddha image was invented just then. But just as naturalistic narrative art in the Roman world appears to have provided a useful model for the stories of the Buddha's life and past lives on Gandhara and stupas, so the classical naturalism of Roman divine images seems to have provided a solution for the Buddha images which also adorned these monuments. Now, images of the historical Buddha and to some extent, the accompanying representations of Buddhas of other eras, like the Bodhisattva Maitreya, the Buddha of the future, were not cult images in the sense of the classical images I've been dealing with in the Roman Empire. 
They were not officially a focus of cult, though the stupa was circumambulating the stupa and coming into proximity with the Buddha's relics was a, was a route to the acquisition of merit, while viewing it was a source of both merit accumulation and self-improvement. The Buddha was regarded as a superhuman figure, though strictly speaking, by achieving enlightenment and ultimately parinirvana upon his death, he attained the goal of self-elimination and release from the cycle of birth and death. So the Buddha is not strictly a god. He doesn't exist in heaven, which may help to explain why he was not represented directly for so long. Nevertheless, in the Buddhism of ancient Gandhara, the Buddha, all of the Buddhas, were effectively worshipped and maintained, uh, and, and they maintained a, a transcendent place in an inclusive pantheon, which absorbed some of the characters of early, of early Hinduism as well. What did, Greco, what did the Greco-Roman form of naturalistic representation bring to images of the Buddha? Classical idealism had strong ethical associations in the Greco-Roman context. The classical face is not just a generic default face. The youthful, impassive classical face had connotations of emotional balance and self-control. The classical facial type must have lent itself to representations of the Buddha as a man who had achieved emotional detachment and understanding of a higher sphere of consciousness through meditation. He is detached from the world and its emotional distractions. The idealism of this classical type also conveys the physical health and strength of the Buddha, who had experimented with and rejected extreme self-denial, seeking a middle way to enlightenment that eschewed the extremes of the ascetics. The shocking uh, fasting Buddha at Lahore, in Lahore Museum, uh, which represents that experiment on the part of the Buddha, shows the sort of realism that Gandharan artists were capable of, but avoided. That ancient Buddhists thought of the historical Buddha and similar figures as physically ideal is confirmed consistently by the literature. Some of this post-dates Gandharan sculpture, certainly in its written form, but a concern with the Buddha's appearance as a sign of its inner qualities is very ancient and consistent. The sculptures always include two of the so-called 32 lakshanas, the physical characteristics of a great man, specifically the swelling cranium, called a nushnisha, uh, which looks like a top knot, and the lump of hair on his forehead, uh, called the ona. But the complete list of these lakshanas includes such idealized features as a straight body and perfectly smooth and delicate skin, as well as others less obvious to us, like webbed fingers and toes. An extended list of minor characteristics in the literature includes, for example, smooth eyebrows, tidy hair, a well-shaped nose, and so on. John Parr's uh, fascinating book, A Bull of a Man, analyzes the picture of ideal masculinity that emerges from the corpus of Buddhist literature. The ideal body is rather different from that of the classical tradition because it's less overtly muscular, more slender and rounded. After all, it comes from his innate qualities and the refining process of innumerable rebirths rather than self-cultivation in the gymnasium. This may explain the relatively feminine appearance of the Buddha in Gandharan art and the appropriateness of the youthful Apolline image for his idealized visualization, since the majority of Gandharan Buddhas lack facial hair. Pars quotes the uh, text called The Discourse with, uh, with uh, Chanki uh, amongst the canonical Buddhist texts, which des describes the Buddha as, quote, handsome, good-looking, graceful, possessing supreme beauty of complexion, with sublime beauty and sublime presence remarkable to behold. Pars concludes, the transcendent physical beauty of the Buddha is a core trope of every text I have seen that discusses his life and teaching career. <laughs> 
So much for the idealism of the Gandharan images. But their specifically naturalistic component is important too, precisely because the Buddha was not a distant god, but a human being who had experienced the lives of his followers. Moreover, he devoted his long life to teaching and attempting to share his wisdom with his followers out of a limitless compassion for the plight of humanity. This is much of the subject matter of the reliefs on the Gandharan stupas, especially in the first, uh, first century or two of that tradition. And the iconic representations of Buddhas made for the same context emphasize his human scale and aspects and aspects of his human nature in contrast perhaps to the scintillating colossal statues that emerged later on uh, at, at Yungang in China, and at Bamiyan in Afghanistan and subsequently more widely. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> classical naturalism offered a method of communicating both aspects of the Buddha's personality and achievements. Uh, and indeed that of other Buddhas and potential Buddhas, the Bodhisattvas. On the one hand, we have the supramundane transcendence. On the other hand, we have the compassionate engagement conveyed by realistic human form and details such as the turn of the head or the soft Venus rings on the neck, as here in this remarkable stucco, uh, probably from Taxila near Islamabad in the Victoria and Albert Museum. <clears throat> the borrowed imagery of Gandharan Buddhism, therefore, seems to me to be a clear-cut case of the use of classical style for a religious purpose, and not because of some kind of hidebound formalism or adherence to convention, but because it was technically useful for evoking a response on the part of... Uh, a response and a personal identification on the part of a highly focused and, and motivated viewer. So this, is, this has been adopted fresh as something that is really efficacious in that contemporary Buddhist context. How much does this have in common with the classical cult imagery of the Roman Empire? I don't wish to deny that the inhabitants of the Roman Empire could have intimate, personally significant relationships with the Olympian gods. But I think we have nothing like the Buddhist literary evidence for a moral investment in the personality of the classical divinity. About the closest I can think of is not straightforwardly religious. Uh, it's in Petronius' Satyricon, where Encolpius empathizes, empathizes with the representations of the gods' homosexual conquests when he sees the faces of these painted lovers in the fictional sanctuary picture gallery at Naples. There are, of course, many other ekphrastic ec responses to divine images and abundant evidence of the rationalistic culture of viewing images of gods. But in the context of Roman the Roman religious picture gallery, as Jeremy Tanner has put it, style does not tacitly shape and mediate the relationship and attitude of the viewer as worshipper towards the God. It is rather available for discursive objectification as the theme of the viewing experience and the evaluation of painterly techne. That's not necessarily to say that the style of the cult images themselves did not mediate the viewing experience of the worshipper, just that the body of literature we have largely deals with a different sort of experience. There is, to be sure, extensive Greco-Roman discussion of the appearance of religious images, including both pagan and Christian critiques and apologiae from Cicero to Julian, but we have little to suggest a personal, emotional responses to the physical appearance of the god in, in the form of its artistic proxy. Perhaps we shouldn't be surprised, though. The classical naturalistic tradition foregrounds possibly the most important aspect of the classical conception of the gods, that, that they are like mortals, or look like mortals in most respects. But putting the divine and the mortal together on the same physical level was not intended to communicate a moral imperative or to make the religious viewer a better or happier being the classical gods remain aloof. They might answer prayers and petitions which worshippers placed 
by or on their statues, not infrequently in the form of curse requests, but no moral transformation was required in exchange, just honour and sacrifices. We're more likely to encounter <clears throat> Apollo self-absorbed in lyre playing or in a narrative scene shooting down the children of Niobe and note the nice comparison with the future Buddha uh, in an archery contest on a Gandharan relief. Um, or we, we might encounter him supervising the flaying of Marcius, uh, which incidentally is very probably the model for this Gandharan Buddhist image of the, the story of Shibi, who, the future Buddha who gives up his own flesh to save the life of a dove. Can't imagine Apollo doing that. In fact, it's hard to think of a Roman deity who might be associated with compassion. I'm sure somebody here can correct me, but I've been thinking, surely not Caritas of third century Roman coins, whose generic image stands for political harmony among rulers, and even the maternal deity on the Arapacus, uh, probably Pax in my view, hardly emanates philanthropy despite her very human physical form. Her late classical statue, known through the apparent Roman copy in Munich on the right, presents an enclosed allegorical vignette rather than someone the worshipper is likely to engage with, I suspect. In conclusion, I don't want to labour the uncontroversial point that ancient Buddhist religion and imagery was very different from that of the Roman world. But what's demonstrated here is the religious versatility of the classical naturalistic tradition, deliberately adopted in Gandhara because of some of the capacities it actively displayed in Roman religion, and yet employed for a radically different aim in its Asian context. To use the language of industry, this is a new application of an existing technology. In fact, it's an artistic, an, an artistic technology whose inherent potential rather than mere tradition or reverence for the classical past, has ensured its continual survival and revival through the centuries down to the present day. And so I'm tempted to finish by describing the classical naturalistic tradition in the rather grandiloquent terms used by Alfred Fouché when he wrote more narrowly of the Buddha's classical iconography. This is what he says. Here is a creation which the experience of centuries have taught us to regard as one of the most widespread and the most durable successes that the history of art has ever chronicled. Thank you. <laughs>